Welcome to our lecture on plant classification. We'll be exploring how plants are named and grouped according to evolutionary relationships. This is a photo from the Evolution Garden at Kew Gardens in London. In this garden, plants are organized by evolutionary relationships. This section of the garden contains plants from a family you are all familiar with by now. What is it? We'll start out today's lecture with some context about how this week's content fits within our broader understanding and recognition that there are many ways of knowing and different knowledge systems approach today's topic differently. Then, using a Western science lens, we'll discuss plant taxonomy, or plant naming, and plant systematics, or how plants are grouped and classified. After that, I'll take you on a tour of some plant families of great ethnobiological significance. I'd like to start by acknowledging that Western science by no means holds a monopoly on naming and classifying organisms, nor does it do so in a better or more complex way than do other knowledge systems. An important element to traditional knowledge systems includes knowledge about naming and classifying organisms. And while these systems do vary among cultures, ethnobiologist Brent Berlin developed a set of general principles that he argued apply across all cultures. Though his findings have been debated, if you're interested in this subfield of ethnobiology, his 1992 book, Ethnobiological Classification, is a classic and could be a good place to start. To give you a glimpse, he writes that all ethnobiological systems of classification organize the salient organisms in one's environment according to a shallow hierarchy of four to six ranks. In this figure from his book, folk taxa, the term given to groups of organisms as defined by a group's traditional knowledge, are represented by faint gray circles. And biological species, those defined by Western science, are black dots. You can see the different levels of classification. The broadest being kingdom, followed by life form, then intermediate, generic, and specific or varietal. You can also see how Western science's biological species might fit into such a classification scheme, sometimes mirroring folk species or varieties, as shown here, where we have four biological species mapping on to four folk species, and sometimes not as you see here, where we have four biological species mapping on to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven folk species. Regarding how organisms are named, he writes that names often allude to organisms' forms, behavior, or ecological features. He gives a number of illustrative examples, like Kayak, which is the name that the Aguaruna Jivaro of Peru give to the bird we might call the red-bellied macaw, because the bird's call sounds like kayak, 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 kayak. So rather than thinking of today's lecture as the only or best way to name and classify plants, consider it as one knowledge systems method for doing so. Bringing it back to the lecture on tech, in which we visualized different knowledge systems existing in parallel to one another, think of it as one among many. Those listed here hold no particular significance to this lecture, but just represent the value of such knowledge held by many different groups of people. So for example, we might think about plant taxonomy and classification as defined by Vietnamese immigrants to Hawaii, 
or the Aguaruna Jivaro of Peru, or by the Lenape of Pennsylvania, or by Western scientists. However, there clearly must be some reason why I chose to teach about how Western science names and classifies plants, rather than how another knowledge system might. Some reasons why learning about this through a Western science lens is particularly relevant in the context of this course, and for us as a group, are First, though they are certainly not entirely apolitical, as written in the chapter you read, Latin names are used and understood by many people across cultures and languages. So if there was a close to universal language for talking about plants, and other life forms as well. This would be it. Second, Latin names and the Western classification system will show up in your future studies in seed catalogs at botanical gardens, basically all over. So knowing a little bit about them will open many opportunities, academic and otherwise, for continued botanical learning. And third, it is just jaw-dropping, jaw-dropping to consider how many species from around the world are recognized by Western science, as well as the astounding array of data supporting the current classification system. And last, learning a system that includes the plants wherever you are or wherever you may be will undoubtedly empower you to better notice the plants around you and understand how they fit into broader ethnobiological contexts. Let's start off by looking at plant taxonomy, or the system of naming plants. All plants have a unique Latin binomial, written according to a particular convention. For example, Acer saccharum is the Latin binomial for sugar maple. Acer is the generic name or genus. It is a unique noun, so in this case, the genus of all maples. The convention is to write the genus with a capital first letter and in italics, or underlined if handwritten. Saccharum is the specific epithet. Unlike the genus, the specific epithet is not unique to this plant or group of plants. Instead, it is an adjective, here meaning sugar, and you often see the same specific epithets repeating again and again. Only when written together with the genus does it form a unique species name. It is written in a similar way as the genus, except all lowercase level letters. Sometimes you'll see a name or abbreviation written after the specific epithet, never in italics. This is the authority or name of the person who introduced the plant and its name to Western science. In the chapters, the author referred to this person as the discoverer. But let's think instead of the authority, as Kimmerer wrote, as the person responsible for, quote, listening and translating the knowledge of other beings. You also might see SP or SPP, not in italics, written after the genus. With one P, this means a particular species that is not identified or known. With two Ps, this means a group of species within the genus. Learning and using proper binomial nomenclature is important for several reasons. First, in accordance with Berlin, Berlin's universal principles of taxonomy, Latin binomials are descriptive and tell us something about the plant. Acer saccharum, for example, tells us that this is a sweet maple tree, referring to the sap used to make maple syrup. Second, Latin binomials tell us something about a plant's evolutionary relationships, since all species of the same genus are closely related. Third, as I mentioned previously, Knowing Latin binomials opens many doors for communication across languages and cultures, as well as for continued learning. And finally, Latin binomials are precise, or in other words, 
singular and unique for each species. Much confusion can arise when relying on common names, since two groups may use the same common name to refer to different plants, or different common names to refer to the same plant. Using a Latin binomial alleviates such confusion. For example, pawpaw is a common name for each of the tr trees and their fruits shown here. The first, we often refer to as papaya here in the U.S. And the second is, of course, our native custard apple. If I was writing an ingredient label for a product that used one of these fruits, and I just wrote pawpaw, we wouldn't know which fruit the product actually contained. This is why it would be less ambiguous to accompany the common name with the Latin binomial. This is also one of the reasons why, in your formal writing, I'd like you to get in the habit of accompanying any common name with the proper Latin binomial and family at first mention. After that, you can use whichever name feels right. I suggest using the website Tropicos for up-to-date nomenclature. Tropicos can certainly be used in concert with the Wikipedia or internet search, However, Latin names and how plants are classified sometimes change based on new data, and any old page on the internet will not always reflect these changes. Tropicos, which is maintained by the Missouri Botanical Garden, however, is always up to date. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say I want to find the Latin binomial and family for sunflower. There's nothing wrong with starting on Wikipedia to come up with a first guess. So here I'm going to search for common sunflower. Okay, and I see that it is Helianthus annuus. And I see over here this really helpful box. It gives me the genus, the species, and the family, as well as um, other hierarchical assignments. So I see that it's in the Asteraceae. Now let's double check on Tropicos that this is indeed an up-to-date name and family class classification. So here I go on Tropicos. I can search by scientific name, common name, or author or authority. Here we're going to search by scientific name. And I write Helianthus annuus. And I see here that there's many varieties and subspecies, but I'm just looking here for the genus and species. First thing I do is make sure that it's not invalid or illegitimate for any reason, which um, has to do with the history of how names are assigned and approved, but there's no asterisks here, so I'm good. So I click it. And I, so by clicking it and seeing that it wasn't illegitimate tells me that this is an up-to-date name. I confirm the family assignment. I see Asteraceae is listed here, again with no asterisks, so we're good. Um, and also I wanted to show you that Tropicos is fun for other reasons. I can see, for example, lots of common names assigned to this species in places where these common names are spoken or languages that they come from. I can also click on images, lots of images that people have submitted of Helianthus annuus sunflowers. This can also help confirm your um, assignment. And there's even a ethnobotany section here, which tells us some uses of this particular species. So, so in my writing, I'd say, blah, 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 Helianthus annuus asteraceae in parentheses, blah, 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 blah. Related to finding the correct Latin binomial for a plant is correctly identifying the plant in the first place.
like if you're outside and come across a plant you don't know. The best way to do this is through a dichotomous key in which you follow along a series of two choices, kind of like a choose your own adventure, until you come to the end of the line and are given the plant's name. There's a simple example of what this might look like in figure 1711 in the chapter for this week. Some of you that started this course with a strong foundation in botany might be equipped to use a key. But just with the topics we've covered these past few weeks, it could be difficult to be able to understand and apply the terminology. For those of you interested in gaining the vocabulary to use such keys, I highly recommend the book Plant Identification Terminology, which presents definitions and illustrations of many of the terms you might come across. Another option for plant identification is a book describing local flora, like this guide to native plants of the northeastern United States. Often in these, there are lots of pictures in more user-friendly formats, so you can find the plant you're looking for. Some organize plants by family, some by flower color, some by bloom time, etc. And a great option for when you're in the field is to use an app. There are lots of them out there that use pretty incredible technology to identify plants, given a photo. One popular option is PlantSnap. Of course, you'll want to confirm by reading the plant's description and looking at photos, but these can be great tools. Now we'll move on to our next topic, plant systematics or how Western science groups and classifies plants according to evolutionary relationships. The first thing to know is that this classification system draws primarily from data about DNA, or plants' genetic material, to infer how plants' lineages evolved over time to result in all of the diversity we see today. Other supporting forms of data include chemistry, morphology, related to plant structures, and fossil evidence. These evolutionary relationships are displayed as phylogenetic trees, like the one we saw last week that displays a bird's eye view of all of the diversity of life on Earth. To get a better idea of how to read phylogenetic trees, we are going to zoom in on the angiosperms and look at just one evolutionary lineage within the angiosperms called the monocots. So we're zooming in here and within there to the monocots. This tree comes from one of my favorite websites, The Botanist in the Kitchen. It shows some important monocots in the human diet. Some major things to know to understand such a tree are, a tree such as this, are the tips of the tree represent extant taxa, or names of living organisms. These might be listed as Latin species, or, as written here, common names of food crops, which also happen to co coincide with distinct species in this case. All of the lines leading to these taxa are called branches. Their pattern indicates the evolutionary history leading to the taxa listed. You can think of time moving in the direction from the past, or base of the tree, to the present, or tips of the tree, along these branches. Points at which the branches connect are called nodes. These represent speciation events that separated one group of organisms for another, from another. So for example, at this node, here at the base of the tree, plants adapted the characteristic of having seeds with a single cotyledon, or first leaf. So all the taxa that appear after this node, in this case, the entire tree minus this first branch, share this characteristic. When we want to refer to all of the descendants from a particular node, we call this group a clade, like the group circled here. This means they all share some evolutionarily significant characteristics. 
A plant family, for an example, is a type of clade. You can determine how closely related two taxa are by following their branches back in time to their first common node. This is considered their most recent common ancestor. The more recent the most recent common ancestor is, the more closely related two taxa are. So you can see here that agave, agave and asparagus with their most recent common ancestor here, are more closely related to each other than are agave and sarsaparilla, because agave and sarsaparilla have their most common, most recent common ancestor way back here. And this is even though both asparagus and sarsaparilla appear next to agave on their branch tips. So when you see many branches coming out of a single node, right here, for example, it means that we either don't know the evolutionary history leading to these groups, or that the branching patterns are just collapsed for purposes of simplicity on the diagram. Knowing how to read phylogenetic trees is an important skill for understanding the basis of evolutionary relationships in biodiversity. We come across trees not infrequently in our everyday lives. For example, in reporting about the evolution of viruses like COVID. So I hope this skill will empower you to avoid common ways that people misinterpret them. From the relationships depicted on such trees, we can classify plants according to different hierarchical levels. Each hierarchical level represents a clade. These hierarchical levels are from most specific, species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. So for example, domain represents a large clade, kingdom, a clade within that clade, etc., etc. Every plant is assigned to a group at each level. So looking at maize, its, exam its assignments are domain eukarya, kingdom plantae, phylum anthophyta, class monocotyledons, order poales, family Poaceae, genus Zaea, species Zaea maize. I chose to focus on families in this course because they are a Goldilocks-like, just right level of classification, with patterns that group species into manageably sized, yet still informative groups. Being able to assign plants to their families will tell you characteristics of them that are relevant to nutrition including allergies that people have to a group of related plant foods, medicine, cooking, agriculture, and ecology, or how they interact with other organisms in their environment. As you see here. Now, as you know, each week, I'll be highlighting a particular plant family Today, instead of a single plant family of the week, I'm going to introduce you to seven families. These are families you'll likely encounter, you likely encounter frequently, especially in your food. Some of these we'll see as plant families of the week again, and some not. I want to first mention that there are three optional readings this week that you can refer to for further learning about most of the plant families covered in this course. These include a field guide by Lena Strew at Rutgers, selected sections of Deborah Madison's botanically organized cookbook, Vegetable Literacy, and a website based on Thomas Elpel's popular Botany in a Day book. This quick tour, combined with those additional references, should give you the tools you need for the activity this week. For each family, 
I'll list some key identifying characteristics that generally, but not always, apply to each family, as well as highlight some members you might know. Consider the following just an initial introduction to your new family friends. The real getting to know them will come through the activity, will come through this week's activity, and your continued mindful engagement with them in the coming weeks. So we'll start with the Amaranthaceae, or Goosefoot family. I mentioned that classification assignments often change based on new DNA evidence. This is one example, and now all members of the former Quinopodiaceae, or quinoa family, now belong to the Amaranthaceae. The following are shared characteristics among members of the Amaranthaceae. Many have goosefoot-shaped leaves. They have small flowers, often um, positioned in spikes of groups of flowers. Their fruit type is called a utricle, um, utricles being small, one-seeded fruits. Um, think of what you see when you eat quinoa, which is a utricle and not a grain fruit. They produce betalins, um, which are a group of plant pigments only in the order to which the amaranthaceae belongs to, which is called the caryophyllales order. Um, all other plant groups produce different shades of reds, pinks, and purples through um, compounds called anthocyanins. But once you start noticing the amaranthaceae plants and their colors um, and the other plants in this order, you'll develop an eye for how beta pigments are distinct. And this family has lots of edible wild herbs. Some examples of plants you might know in this family include amaranth, beets, Swiss chard, spinach, goosefoot, and quinoa. The photo I included here shows many of the characteristics that I described. So these are freshly harvested quinoa plants. You can see the beautiful array of betalin pigments. You can see these goosefoot shaped leaves. You can see the clusters of small utricles, um, which are where the flower spikes had been. Our next family is the Apiaceae or carrot family. Characteristics of this family include compound or feathery leaves, as you see here on this fennel plant, hollow stems, small flowers that are organized in umbels, and here's an example on this parsley of an umbel flower arrangement. Umbel um, is related to the word umbrella, so you can see why that might apply. The fruits are a type of fruit called a schizocarp, um, and this is a fruit with two parts that break into halves that are each called mesocarps. And when we eat a dill seed, we're actually eating a mesocarp coming from the schizocarp fruit. There are many toxic members to this family, in addition to the edible members, um, and many aromatic members. So many of our herbs um, and spices come from this family. Some examples that you might know include carrot, celery, parsley, fennel, cilantro and coriander, cumin, dill, and anise. Our next family is the brassicaceae, or mustard family. Characteristics of this family include sometimes having um, silvery green leaves, um, as you can see here with um, these waxy leaves on a field of broccoli. Flowers with four sepals and four petals. Here you can see four petals. Um, and this is actually why this family is also sometimes called the crucifers because the flowers look like crosses. So you can think of your cruciferous vegetables. That's because of this four-parted flower structure. 
The fruit type are siliques or silicles, which is a type of pod, like you can see here on garlic mustard. This family has many edible weeds and um, it's known for its mustard oils, which give it that flavor that you recognize among its members. So members of this family that you might know include broccoli, cauliflower, collard greens, kale, cabbage, radish, turnip, wasabi, garlic mustard, and arugula. And you'll notice that many of these vegetables are the same species. And that means that they all were domesticated from the same wild relative, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. Our next family is the cucurbitaceae, or gourd family. This family often includes vines with tendrils, palmate or palmately veined leaves. Think about like the palm of your hand. Separate pollen bearing and ovule bearing flowers. Here you can see the anthers of the pollen bearing zucchini flower here. And this is the stigmatic surface of the ovule bearing zucchini flower. Flowers with five sepals and five fused petals, as you see here. Inferior ovaries, so this means ovaries that emerge um, under the emergence of the sepals and petals, which of course re results in fruits that um, swell below the other flower parts. And their fruits are berries, which means they're simple fruits that are fleshy with many leaves. Examples of cucurbits include cucumbers, pumpkin, zucchini, butternut squash, watermelon, cantaloupe, and bitter melon. And then we have the Fabaceae, or bean and pea family. Members of this family often have compound leaves. So remember, these are leaves made up of smaller leaflets. Bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical flowers. So if I draw a line right down the center, we have two mirroring images but I can't do that um, in other directions. Fruits that are legumes, so what we often call bean or peas, pods, and these plants are nitrogen fixing. This means they capture nitrogen in the air, which exists in the air in an unusable form for plants, and they transform it to a form that is usable with the help of nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in their root nodules. So here you can see these little balls on the roots of the soybean plant. Those are the root nodules that house the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Some members of this family include green beans, lentils, sugar snap peas, soybeans or edamame, tamarind, chickpea, jicama, and fava bean. And now we have the Lamiaceae, or mint family. This family is known for its square stem cross sections, as you can see really nicely here with the, this cut stem of catnip, or you can even see the angles here on the spearmint. Opposite leaf arrangement, so remember this means two leaves coming out of each node. These here are axillary buds that are sprouting. Bilaterally symmetrical flowers, again, like we saw before, but these are characterized by having upper and lower lips, um, which is why they have an alternative family name called the labiate, um, meaning lip, and aromatic leaves. Some members of this family include basil, spearmint, oregano, rosemary, sage, lavender, lemon balm, and catnip. 
And now we have our final family, the Solanaceae, or nightshade family. This family is characterized by often having fuzzy leaves, five parted flowers with petals fused and sepals fused. You can see the fusion here, and this sometimes results in conical or funnel-shaped flowers. What botanists call banana anthers, which is these really characteristic banana-looking anthers that you'll get a feel for as you um, see more flowers in this family. Their fruits are berries, which I described before, and they produce alkaloids, um, typically in their leaves and their stems. Um, and alkaloids are compounds that are often poisonous, um, and they can be narcotic, um, they can be hallucinogenic, and or medicinal. Some plants in the Solanaceae that you might know include tomato, tomatillo, tobacco, potato, hot and sweet peppers, eggplant, and ground cherry. And that concludes our lecture on plant classification. And just so I don't leave you hanging, if you didn't get it on the intro slide, the family displayed here is the Asteraceae, or sunflower family.